Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Karen Peters, and uh, this is our last budget meeting of the year, of the cycle. Um, uh, Councilwoman Mendoza is going to kick us off, but before I do that, I want to introduce our interpreter in the back of the room. Sandra, you want to say a word or two to the group? Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to the councilwoman who will... Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, and I want to introduce uh, the, our mayor's office representative this evening, Jimmy Arwood, please raise your hand. If anyone has questions for the mayor's office, he's here to, to answer them. <laughs> Thanks, Jimmy. Okay, um, I'll, I'll turn it over to the councilwoman and then we'll have a video. Thank you, thank you, Karen. Thank you, everyone, for being here today, and thank you for being part of the process. Your feedback is very important. So we're going to start with the um, with the video, right? Okay. Thank you. Welcome to your first look at the City of Phoenix trial budget for 2019-20, proposed by the City Manager for public review and comment. The City budget is about people and programs for a stronger Phoenix. Every year, the city prepares a trial budget. This process gives you, our residents, an opportunity to share your priorities and feedback on how tax dollars are spent. Three important points about this year's budget. It is balanced, which is required by law, and there is a surplus to allocate toward people and programs. Also, for the first time since the recession, ongoing revenues are equal to ongoing costs. We have a nearly $1.4 billion structurally balanced general fund budget thanks to Phoenix's continued strong economy and sound leadership by the mayor and city council. These efforts have led to a projected surplus of $55 million, of which $35 million is in ongoing resources and $20 million is in one-time resources. Over the next several minutes, we'll provide you a high-level view of the recommendations for how that surplus could be spent. Approximately 70% of the surplus is proposed for employee compensation, and the remaining 30% is proposed for services. And $5.5 million to continue investing in the Public Safety Pension Reserve Trust Fund to protect against unexpected downturns in investments. The 2019-20 trial budget continues to provide the core services residents expect. Chief among these is public safety. In addition, many recommendations are focused on improving neighborhoods, parks, libraries, support for outreach and services for people experiencing homelessness, additional street landscape maintenance, and preparations for the 2020 census. The city also continues to invest in maintaining the facilities you depend on and the fleet of vehicles that provide you everything from police response to street cleanups. Besides these proposals, we'll highlight expenditures that help the city address growth in construction and maintain the city's wastewater infrastructure. First, general fund recommendations. The general fund is made up of several different sources of revenue, including sales taxes, state shared revenue, and property taxes. Three-fourths of the general fund pays for police, fire, and courts, with a smaller portion, the remaining 25%, going for everything else, like libraries, parks, senior services, arts, and administrative and support functions. The primary focus of the general fund service additions is public safety across a wide array of departments. Here are some of the proposals. Eight new firefighter positions to provide 24-hour operations at Fire Station 55 at I-17 and Joe Max Road in North Phoenix. Add funding for seven sworn fire positions, creating a new ambulance rescue unit at Fire Station 58 to improve emergency response times in Southwest Phoenix. The creation of one new fire department crisis intervention unit and in the police department, de-escalation training and community response services support for officer involved shootings. 
these recommendations are based on public feedback from last year's budget process and the city's Traumatic Incident Intervention Resources Ad Hoc Committee. Another key area of public safety funding is focused on improving police support processes, using civilian staff to free up police officers' valuable time for calls and service. First, the addition of 10 civilian positions to support a federally mandated transition to the FBI's Uniform Crime Reporting National Incident-Based Reporting System and second, the addition of 13 positions to streamline police booking procedures and create two new centralized booking centers to get officers back on the street faster. The trial budget also provides funding for increased inspection capacity to ensure buildings are meeting fire safety codes. Other public safety allocations, public defender representation for veterans and individuals with mental illness, in human services, add a caseworker and a vehicle to provide mobile victim advocacy. Security guard staffing at every library. Technology funding for cybersecurity to protect the city's infrastructure. In all, the trial budget proposes spending an additional $6.5 million on these and other public safety additions. Now, let's look at where you live, investments in programs to strengthen neighborhoods. First, the budget would allocate approximately $1 million to add staff to work with neighborhood groups, to clean up blight, work with nearby businesses, and improve response times for neighborhood issues. Parks and Recreation would see eight new park ranger positions to increase patrol coverage at neighborhood and urban parks for a cost of about $1.1 million. Street transportation and public works would support neighborhoods by transitioning staff from a temporary to permanent status to clean up encampments and washes and right-of-way for a cost of $970,000. Historic preservation would also get $75,000 to support historic property preservation. In all, neighborhood revitalization would see an additional $3.5 million in funding. Next, community services additions restore some desired programs to strengthen the community and expand other resident requests, including restoration of Sunday library hours at four branches means all libraries will be open to provide greater access to in-demand books, movies, classes, and programs for library patrons of all ages. Expand the Phoenix Teens program for youth at 10 city sites providing youth programs six days per week at a cost of $448,000. Providing case management assistance for homeless seniors and grant funding for arts organizations for youth and underserved communities would also be included. The budget would also add $1.3 million for long-standing street landscape maintenance needs, increasing frequency of maintenance from three to four times per year. New this year, a proposal to allocate funding to implement participatory budgeting or other projects in city council districts. Lastly, the city will invest in outreach to encourage residents to take part in the 2020 census. Given the move to digital form submission this census, the additional funds will help to ensure hard to count and hard to reach populations participate so that Phoenix gets its fair share of the approximately $866 million in annual revenues allocated through federal programs for public safety, transportation, housing, and human services. Overall, added general fund expenditures outlined in the trial budget total $55.2 million and would add 131 positions to strengthen our people, programs, services, and infrastructure. Moving on to propose non-general fund additions for a variety of services. Strengthening our street transportation department with 11 positions added or converted to full time for a variety of services to support increasing work in the right of way and the recently expanded street maintenance funding in the capital improvement program budget, $768,000. 
Water Services will see 21 positions and approximately $2.9 million in funding to keep up with demand at the department's 91st Avenue treatment site, the state's largest. The site is currently treating 180 million gallons of water a day for more than 2.5 million residents in five cities. Finally, 19 positions for planning and development to address increasing construction demand, including reduction of turnaround times for pre-application submittals and complex commercial architectural plans. Added staff to ensure adherence to fire system requirements and ADA accessibility codes, and to maintain a 24-hour turnaround time for residential inspections. Thank you for taking the time to learn more about the 2019-20 trial budget. We hope that you'll review additional details in the budget pamphlet available at one of our 19 community budget hearings and online at phoenix.gov budget. Please share your feedback in whatever way works best for you at a public meeting or via email at budget.research at phoenix.gov. You can comment on the city's social media at City of Phoenix AZ on Facebook or Twitter and use hashtag Phoenix Budget or call us at 602-262-4800. Thank you for being part of this important process. Okay. Um, thanks again, everyone, for being here this evening, and thanks to all the city staff who are, are here with us tonight. Uh, we are recording this meeting. It'll be on uh, YouTube and the, and the city's uh, Channel 11 station. Um, you can refer to it later. But because we are recording, if you are making comments, not only do we need you to fill out a card, but we need you to come and speak into the microphone so, so that everyone can hear hear your comments. There are budget pamphlets uh, at the table in the back. Uh, make sure you take one of those. And I believe, uh, and Jeff's waving it there, um, we'll, uh, we'll start with speaker cards and um, have three, three minutes each. And I'll, I'll ask uh, the councilwoman to continue from here. Thanks so much. We're going to start with our first speaker, Mary Rose Wilcox. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Testing, testing. Thank you. Let me first start out, uh, Councilman uh, Mendoza, to thank you for coming into our community to uh, get our input on the budget and. Uh, Thank you for tonight, and thank you for all the work that you've done uh, over at Grant Park. Um, what I want to talk about, my purpose in coming up and speaking to you, is I want to state in the most strongest terms my belief that Arizona Public Service has for decades perpetuated environmental racism in the Grand Park community. I um, do have a request that I'll make regarding the budget, but I want to talk about the devastation of the relationship that APS has had with the Grand Park community. And I want to start by saying that um, my grandmother uh, in 1930 um, bought a piece of property at 708 South 3rd Avenue, just across the street from Grand Park. And growing up in the Grand Park neighborhood at that time, it was a beautiful neighborhood, beautiful neighborhood. Uh, I, my mother, and 10 brothers and three sisters were all born across the street at Memorial Hospital. We attended Grant School. We attended Lowell School. We spent a lot of time at Grand Park. And the, um, the neighborhood was a very beautiful neighborhood at that time. Around 1960, APS needed power for, for downtown. And from 1st Avenue to 7th Avenue, there were literally hundreds of residents that lived in that area between Grant Street and Lincoln, between 1st and 7th. 
If you go there right now, you'll see nothing but a huge electrical power plant. And as a result of that, the relocation of all those families and all those children, we had a school, Grant Park, I'm a Grant School. Grant School was no longer needed because of the decrease of families in the neighborhood. If you look down Third Avenue at that time, you look down some of those First, First Avenue, Second Avenue, um, Mountain Zuma, Fourth, they were beautiful streets. About 1960, when they relocated all those people to put in the power plants, the, the lines and the poles that were put in our neighborhood basically devaluated our whole property. Our property started going down. We lived, as I said, at 708 South Third Avenue. We were forced, we were forced, APS came in and we were forced to live, leave our property because they wanted to take that over to do some training in that, in that area. As you know, Grand Park is, the neighborhood is a, a his, very historical neighborhood. And uh, council woman, I have a packet that I'm going to make some uh, visual presentations. And I want to give one to you, and then want to give one to the mayor's office. And the presentation will correlate with the visuals that I have. But the environmental racism that have been perpetuated by the APS has been going on for decades. And as I stated, the neighborhood is a beautiful neighborhood. If you go there now, you will see that this historical neighborhood is very unique because it has El Portal restaurant, which is designated historical. It has American Legion next door that is historical. Uh, Friendly House is historical. Even Grand Park is designated historical by the city of Phoenix. I doubt that you will find anywhere in the city of Phoenix where you have so much historical sites within a close proximity. Um, if you look in the packet, you'll see that um, there is a definition of the, um, that has been put out. And uh, if I can just read it, and you have that in your uh, but it says Grand Park, Grand Park, rich in history and prime for redevelopment, Grand Park is one of 13 neighborhoods in the community of Central City South. Latino heritage and culture is strong in Grand Park, which is also the home to Friendly House, which has served new immigrants since 1915. It is also the home of American Legion Post 41, the first legion to allow Hispanics as members after World War II, El Portal Restaurant, which my wife and I own, St. Anthony's Catholic Church, Grand Park Community Garden, the La Canasta Mexican Restaurant, and Grand Park Community Center, famous also for its midnight basketball classic that is known not only here in the city of Phoenix, but is known the program that Mary Rose and I started 50 years ago at Grand Park and uh, is known throughout the whole, the whole nation. But I say that because I wanted to underscore, underscore the historical significance of the, that particular neighborhood. I want to show you how APS, Arizona Public Service, has treated this historical neighborhood. I don't think that this other historical neighborhood in the city of Phoenix has been so abused by a corporation as APS. What I want to do, and you have in your packet, some of these, Londo, you come up. This is my grandson, but I wanted to show you, my grandson's going to be holding some of these you have in your packet. But this is what I'm talking about. These, these are, this is the power plant right next to Grand Park. 
Grand Park where literally hundreds of families and children go for events there at the park. And you can see that we're located right next to this power plant. That's the power plant that came in in the 60s and moved everybody out. This, is, this street right here is Third, Third Avenue. At one point when I was growing up, this is a beautiful neighborhood. We had buses going through there. We had people coming down the street and selling vegetables. Uh, but look at what they've done, APS, on both sides of the streets. These power lines from Grant Street all the way down to Yavapai, past the, the Lowell School, these power plants came in. We were never, we were never told that we were, they were going to be put in. On both sides of the streets, this, this is Third Avenue, the street that I grew in, and this is Grand Park. These are other pictures, Lonzo, show them this one. This is Grand Park. And I show you this because of the proximity of the plant to the park. This is another, another visual of Grant Street. Our restaurant is right here, Grant Park. Third Avenue, Second Avenue and Grant, but looking west, you can see the blight that these electrical, the power plant and the poles look like in our neighborhood, historical neighborhood. This is Third Avenue in Sherman. Not only did APS out of nowhere come in and start putting these power plants, but they, they went down Third Avenue, they went Grant, and they went down Sherman. This is Sherman Street. Look at these huge power plants. To our knowledge, we were never apprised. They just came in with trucks and started putting these lines. We never knew about it. But this is the site from 3rd Avenue West on Sherman. This is some of the other, and I show you this, to underscore the, the ugly poles that are in our historical neighborhood. Now. Would this be allowed in the Story neighborhood? Would this be allowed in the Coronado neighborhood or up north? But you have these right in the center, next to a park, next to a school in the Grant Park neighborhood. These are other additional visuals of the lines that have gone up in our neighborhood, these here. And this is the, the line on 2nd Avenue in Sherman. If you walk out just a block away, you can see them. All of the neighborhood. And I say this because, okay, not only have we been subjected to, to these power plants in our neighborhood, but guess what, Councilwoman? They want to put another power plant in the neighborhood. They want to come in on 4th Avenue, APS, they want to come in on 4th Avenue and Grant. This is the property that they're looking at to put an additional power plant in our neighborhood. We have been fighting them now for a year, about a year, been having meetings with APS to say, you don't you think that we've had enough already? Don't you think that you've already destroyed our neighborhood? And now you want to come in and you want to put an additional power plant at this location. We had a meeting here a month ago, and we had a uh, press conference outside where we came in to protest this site. And their, their position was they had, you'd walk in, and their presentation was, well, you want this site or you want this site? It's sort of like pick your poison. What do you want it? The other site that they had in mind was the contaminated site where the apartments were at, where they cleaned up. They cleaned, we, about five years ago, they wanted to do a huge development in that area. And we basically said, how are you going to do a development when you got contamination on those apartments? We forced APS to clean up that site and move those families from that site. So it's two sites that they're looking at, the Fifth Avenue site and they're looking at the apartment, the Grant Park apartment sites. You'd come into the meeting and they tell you, oh, what, do you want this or do you want that? I don't want any, any one of those sites. And of course, they argue that 
we, we need the energy, we need the power because downtown is growing so much. It's downtown this, downtown that, downtown this. They even got some people in our community saying, well, they need the energy for downtown. Yeah, what about Grand Park? What about our neighborhood? The APS has literally millions of dollars. They're going to put up additional power plants, and they're going to make additional, not millions, but billions of dollars. Don't they have a responsibility to our neighborhood? These are other pictures of the site that they're looking at to put that additional power plant. I'm going to wrap up. This is another picture of the site. This is another picture of a, the site. This is all the two sites that they're looking at. Well, not only in Grand Park do we have this problem, but just four blocks from here, we have in your package. Do you have these kinds of lines from APS that are hanging as we speak? Right here, two blocks away. These pictures, look at these. It's an embarrassment. Look at these pictures here, right? These poles, right in front of people's homes. Right there, two blocks away. Look at, in our city, not only in Grand Park, but just next door to our neighbors. So we know, and we're not going to get into my belief that these power lines they emit electromagnetic fields that cause cancer. I believe they cause cancer and other health problems. This is a graph, I'll be wrapping up. This is the graph of some of the, if you're so far from it, it tells you the dangers of electromagnetic fields. What we plan to do, and I'll be wrapping up, Councilwoman, um, we're, gonna do a, we're gonna do a survey in the neighborhood uh, regarding a questionnaire that we're going to be asking. You have the questionnaire there. And it indicates a bunch of uh, um, medical problems that people have in our community. But lastly, let me just say this, is that we need your help. We need your help in this budget that before APS puts another power plant and further degrades our neighborhood, our historical neighborhood, that the city of Phoenix puts in their budget, we think about $100,000 to do a study in terms of the dangers of additional poles, electric magnetic fields, more power plants in this neighborhood. We're trying, there's a number of people here that live in the Grand Park neighborhood. We're trying to save our neighborhood. There's people moving in our neighborhood that are doing a really good job. In, in picking up the neighborhood. But APS, once again, as they've done for decades, through their environmental racism that don't care about a poor neighborhood, they're gonna destroy this neighborhood if we don't get their attention and tell them, you know what, councilwoman and mayor, city, the mayor's office, we think Grand Park has already had enough, that they're already carrying too much. Maybe you ought to find another site. So hopefully, the, a study can be funded by the city of Phoenix, where we take a step back and find out the impact of what's going on in this historical neighborhood and tell APS, tell APS that maybe we ought to, we ought to stop picking on, the, on Grand Park. Now, I would just caution you, and I'm gonna be very honest, and it pains me to say this, that the lady that is organizing these meetings about wanting to put the power plant in here, Kendra, I don't know her last name, you know Kendra, nice lady. She's in a lot in the neighborhood. But one of the agencies that she sits on is um, Phoenix Revitalization, okay? They do a good job. But she sits on that board and they have so much influence in this neighborhood. I hope that if we get to a point where you're unable to fund the study, that you work with us to put the right people on that committee that will really do a good job. Not, not people that have a vested interest in that outcome of that, of that study. So I know, Councilwoman, that I've taken 
more than my time, but I hope that you would help us. That I hope that your influence in the mayor's office. I know that APS is powerful, that they have millions of dollars, that they're going to make millions of dollars, but tell them that our neighborhood has already gotten beaten up enough, and we want to save our neighborhood and see if there's another alternative to putting that new power plant that they want to do right in our neighborhood. Thank you very much, Council. Next speaker, Grace Salinas. Hello, okay. Councilwoman, community members. My name is Grace Arroyo Salinas, and I live at Marcos de Nisas, which is one of the public housings in this community. Um, I am also have been a lifetime uh, resident of Central City South, and um, I first became aware of the budget hearings in 2002 and went to my first budget hearing at that time, and I found out that they were gonna close our senior center and they were gonna close our parks. And I couldn't believe anybody had that kind of power over the communities. So um, at that time, we were overrun by gangs, prostitutes, and drug dealers. We went to every budget hearing on, at 2000, in 2007, again, we lost what felt like most of our police force. Our park programs were cut, our library hours and days were cut, and we were threatened that our senior centers would be closed. So again, here we are, a community that uh, wants to work and is faced with budget cuts that will be devastating to our neighborhoods. We continued going to all the budget hearings. In 2013, again, we're told, we're gonna close all the parks and the pools in Central City South. We're going to shut down all the senior centers but one, and uh, also the homeless ruled our neighborhood. There wasn't a place we could go where they weren't congregated, they threatened our kids, they catcalled our little girls, and pretended like they were gonna reach and grab them. This was a really bad time for us. We were at our bottom low. We continue going to all the budget hearings. In 2019, guess what? Our community has responded to all the budget hearings and I am here today to say thank you for giving us more police, giving us park rangers, making sure the homeless stay out of our park. I'm here to thank you, and Phoenix PD, if you're here, you rule. You rule in our neighborhood. Our library is restored. Uh, we are free, or we don't see them. Prostitute drug dealers roaming our streets, and we don't see any gang violence uh, um, in our neighborhood. But most of, low, most of all, we're homeless free in our park. We did have an incident a month ago where a homeless man broke into a home where a mother, her eight-year-old daughter, and newborn's lives were threatened. But our heroes, the police, showed up in time and saved the family. They were on the news, so you guys will know what we're talking about. There is a homeless in our neighborhood summary available in Phoenix Revitalization Corporation website. Go there and check it out. Let's find a solution for the homeless. It's important. If homelessness is important to you, go and find as many as you can and take them home and take care of them until they can get on their feet. Or tell your church to take as many as they can and support them. But be part of the solution. Do not give them a fish. Teach them how to fish. Join our programs with your solutions. But don't ask us here in Central City South to let them live in our parks and live on our streets. Again, I thank you, City of Phoenix, police, everybody. We thank you. At Marcos, we know how to be grateful, and we're here for whatever service is called, we're called upon.
Next speaker, Hope Salinas. Hope Salinas. Next speaker, Eva Olivas. If I had to write notes, I wouldn't forget. Thank you, Councilwoman, for coming. Thank you, everybody. Um, I have to tell you, um, this meeting was not scheduled for this site, um, and I was very excited when I was able to call the office and say our, the people in our neighborhoods don't get an opportunity to speak. It, for some reason, is always kind of left off, off the agenda. We're not South Phoenix. We are Central City South. For those of you who have been here forever, this is how um, you know we, we look at it. We also are not downtown, because going over the railroad tracks for us is like going to China, a whole different community. So we appreciate that you came. Um, so uh, just a couple things. One, I, I reviewed the budget. And I have to tell you, this is the first time I haven't felt like I have to come here and just like bang the walls. And I was very excited for um, um, the increase in the police. And, and one thing I, I want to say is that the police department is um, it's, it's very, how do I say this? I don't want a police department that is not at least meeting the minimum quota of what a per capita should be for police uh, service. So I was, I'm happy that we're trying to get to that point. And uh, we've been so under for a long time. For five years ago, I expressed to Mayor Stanton my concern that you know we were like three, 400 police officers down. Um, and the other thing was that I was very concerned that there was not training for them, that there were not, um, um, you know, trainings that would equip them appropriately in order to do their jobs in multiple uh, neighborhoods. The other thing is, uh, regarding the, the impact of the homeless, I'm, I'm very excited that we are, um, you know, working with many providers, um, but I, we are very concerned about the impact of, onto the neighborhoods of the presence of so many homeless. Um, and so, I was, would like to see where in the budget it could fit, or if, um, if it's there already, and I don't know. But you know, there's always a liaison with providers for the services, uh, but there's not a liaison for the impact to neighborhoods. You know, so we need somebody who kind of is in the middle to understand what's the impact, and, and then also with the providers to ensure that they get what they need. You know, this community has been very good to the homeless campus that is literally three or four blocks away. Um, when the campus came, they were, you know, asked this community and the community on the north side of the campus that they would house 425. Um, but now they're wanting thousands. And it's okay, except that they don't helicopter people into the campus. They literally walk through all of our neighborhoods. And many of them, the pathway, it, they stop multiple times. And, and as you know, the homeless carry everything that they own with them. So you know, it, it's the foot traffic impact and some of the, the blight that comes with the, the traffic that makes it extremely hard for our neighborhoods uh, for people to go to the park. For, so we need something that will help people understand more, uh, more clearly that we want to be able to go to the park no different than any other neighborhood in the city. People that live on 56th Street in Camelback, people who live you know, on the north side in Ahwatukee, their parks are clean, their streets are clear. You know, We want the same thing here, so that's all we're asking for. Um, and the other thing is I, I have a couple questions on um, the kind of the, the city started an equality um, and an equity committee that was kind of sort of dissolved. Um, so it was through, I think, because of the light rail, they started an equity. It was kind of a study that was done with, in partnership with several people from other states. But what it did make me think about was, you know, is where in the city's department is it? Um, uh, where in the city department, or whose job in the city is it to ensure that all the policies and all the processes have some equity, that there's distribution of responsibility and services through all 
every neighborhood in the city. So I, I guess I'm a little concerned that I didn't see anything come out of that study. Well, and it was kind of, I, I think, a, a response to, I don't know what it was. But anyway, and then last. Just real quick, okay. I know what you're talking about, but we're going to connect you with Morkita. Yes. OK. Um, she has all that information that okay, you're asking. Great. So, um, well, I, and I wanted it not to be a study that ended. I wanted it to be an ongoing thing. And also, uh, you know, how can the community be involved in those conversations so that we can say, what does it look like to us? Because, you know, one of the things I struggled with when I served on that committee was even the city couldn't define what that meant. You know, so we were like, mm, okay, if you don't see it, then how can you should be listening to us. Anyway, um, and then the last thing is that I, I think it's important in all of the departments that there be a something that talks about community versus the economic development everything in life that the city does is always about the dollar and always about economic development but there's not enough in there that really focuses on building community strengthening neighborhoods and those are the kinds of things that we really would like to see i do thank you for all the uh, recovered services that we lost from 2008. So I wanted to be real clear that this is not something you're giving us, that's something that we're gaining, uh, that we're getting back that we had before, but our hope is that they are maintained and that we're not next year having to say, okay, now we lost them. So hopefully this budget is strong enough to carry us for many years, so. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Olivas. Next speaker, Isaac Gaspar. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. My name is Isaac Gaspar. I'm an ambassador of Fulfillment and Training, FIT. Um, we are a holistic community development program. We have a goal in mind to help the community with mental health, physical health, as well as bridge the gap between PD and the community. We're trying to change the narrative that the police are something that the community needs to be afraid of. They're here to help us. They're here for resources, and we want FIT to be that gap to come to us for resources, um, to reach out for you know job opportunities, whatever we can do to help the community work as one, because if everyone is united and comes together, we can be successful. That's pretty much all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. Next speaker, Josue Parra. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Josue Parra. So I'm here. Uh, oh, you want to this? We're we're here uh, on behalf of Fit Fulfillment and Training. So just kind of what Isaac was saying. You know, our our main goal is to create the opportunity for the community to gather together and really become one, uh, a very holistic and safe community building programs. Um, and by those resources, we mean as creating resources for. Kind of what Isaac was saying, creating jobs, finding people, uh, helping people to either get health insurance, um, helping people find housing, clothing, food. Um, besides all that, we are, we're also very involved uh, with the community, feeding my starving children, um, going out and cleaning neighborhoods. So there's more to it that our community needs. And um, without the resources, we can't really do nothing without, you know, with it. Um, especially engaging with PD, it, it, that's, that's a huge one. Um, there's a lot of you know, confliction with PD, but in reality, we're all human beings and there's more that we need to do in order. You can't, you can't truly, how do I explain it, um, accomplish anything without all of us gathering together and really coming to one. Um, that's pretty much what I have to say about it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Josue. Next speaker, Rachel Johnson. Thank you. Oh, I would have more than that. Thank you. 
Again, thank you, Councilwoman, for being here. I know you've already heard from me this week, but I just want to take every opportunity that I can to just say thank you. Thank you for your support of arts and culture and the city council as a whole. Um, arts and culture is important to me. I serve on the Arts and Culture Commission. Um, we have a member of the staff here from the Office of Arts and Culture for the City of Phoenix. And sometimes I know people sort of look at art as something that's very altruistic and not relevant to their everyday lives. I realize that we need our first responders and we need to make sure our children have a wonderful education and we need to have safe housing and we need to have um, community support and, and, and we also need resources in order to make that happen on a daily basis. But what I'm here tonight to say is what the beauty that art brings to our lives. It's not even just the art that you see, it's the art that you learn about. It's art learning, it's grants for art organizations. I'm sure every single person in this room has gone out to an art festival or gone out to a festival for, that was maybe for the Italian American Festival or the Arab American Festival or the Caribbean um, Festival. And all of those types of festivals do receive support from the Arts and Culture Office. If you've been to the airport and you've seen the changes to Terminal 3 and the changes that are going to be happening for Terminal 4 and all throughout the airport, if you slow down a little bit, and I'm one of those people that goes rushing through the airport, but if you slow down a little bit, you will actually see art around you. And that is one of those things I think that we take for granted on a daily basis because we see it, but we don't see it. We become accustomed to it. When you're driving down I-10 or you're driving down the 51 and you see that that beautiful overpass. That wasn't just an overpass that was done by the Arizona Department of Transportation with the with um, comment and, and input, obviously, from the city of Phoenix. It is also something that was considered art. And so the Office of Arts and Culture is involved. If you see a beautiful sculpture that has happened, um, that has been created out of a, um, a nasty, smelly um, sanitation unit, well, guess what? That's art that falls under the arts and culture office. If you had a well site in your community that's been a visual blight for years, and all of a sudden this beautiful sculpture goes up just to make it better for the people who live there so they don't have to see the blight, or the, pe or the students who are walking past it every day having to feel like they're unsafe or having to see something that's not um, visually aesthetic to their area, it's not pretty for their area. And art is something that all of us benefit from, whether we're eight years old or whether we're 88 years old. And again, we are the fifth largest city in the country. And from my perspective, as a person who's had the privilege and the honor of serving on the City of Phoenix Arts and Culture Commission, as well as serving on the Public Art Committee, I will tell you, there's so much more that we have to do. We have beautiful culture in our, in our community, whether it's Latino culture, African American culture, Native American culture, Asian culture, let's really bring all of that together in so many different ways. It doesn't have to be a sculpture, it doesn't have to be a painting. We have wonderful artists that I think all of you will be able to see their work as the South, um, the South I call it the South Mountain Extension, I know that's not the proper term, but the extension that will be heading south for the light rail that particular extension, all of the stops will have art from artists from that area. And you will have the benefit of truly seeing what our community has to offer. So again, thank you for your support, but I'm asking City Council for their continued support, and I'm also asking for maintenance for existing projects. Many of the projects, like the ones that happen for the airport, it's not necessarily going to come out of just the regular city side of things. It's going to come out of the aviation budget. But there are many fantastic <coughs> projects around this community, again, that we take for granted that really require maintenance. And the maintenance budget has decreased over the years, and the overall funding has decreased. So we're asking for continued support, asking for maintenance, uh, maybe an enhancement in maintenance support as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your support of art. Um, I, I mentioned before I saw you at the dedication of the park, and the, I, I can't even remember which, which park it was, but I will say, do you, which one? Harmon? Which one? I know what we were on, we were in the, uh, uh, we were in South Mountain area, but in that park, it was a dedication of what anybody would view just as a park, but in that park, 
Art was incorporated in the walkways. There was plenty of shade for people. Art was incorporated in the community center there as well. And so again, these are basic things that we're gonna need, but just incorporating art into our everyday lives. Thank you all for your support and your time. Thank you. And Rachel, thank you for advocating for the arts. For the last 11 years, she's been attending every single budget meeting. So thank you so much for advocating for the arts. Thank you. And that's all the cards we have. Does anybody else want to speak that didn't have the opportunity to fill out a card? No? OK, well, that concludes our budget hearing. Thank you so much for spending your evening with us. And uh, anything else do you want to say? The, 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 the council will, will act on the budget at, in, in a May meeting. And we look forward to, to finishing this process. And thanks for your input very much. <laughs>